I'd like to share with you our scripture reading for the day, as found in Matthew 25, beginning in the first verse. And just to frame that a little bit, I'm going to back up into 24 for just the 42nd verse and then go into chapter 25. Therefore keep watch, because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. At that time the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish, five were wise. The foolish ones, they took their lamps but did not take any oil with them. The wise ones, however, took oil in jars along with their lamps. The bridegroom was a long time in coming and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, the cry rang out, Here's the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all the virgins woke up, trimmed their lamps. The foolish ones said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, our lamps are going out. No, they replied, There may not be enough for both us and you. Instead, go to those who sell the oil and buy some for yourselves. But while they were on the way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later the others also came. Lord, Lord, they said, open the door for us. But he replied, truly I tell you, I do not know you. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know the day or the hour. May God add his blessing upon this reading and hearing of his holy word. <clears throat> Recently, Linda and I had received an invitation to attend a wedding. The invitation had told us who was getting married, where they were getting married, what the date would be, what the time would be. We live in an ordered culture. When we anticipate a special celebration, we know when it will happen, and we set aside that date, that time, we make preparations to be there. <coughs> In Jesus' day, when a young couple was to be married, once engaged, they would wait several weeks, more likely they would wait several months before the event of the wedding. It was the practice of the Jews that once an appropriate bride had been selected, kind of a prearranged marriage for their son, the engagement would occur. And at that time, the, the bride, she would, she would go back to live with her family until such time as the, the bridegroom would have prepared a place for her. And what this meant was he would go back to the family home, kind of a condominium concept of today's thinking where you would have the grandparents, the parents, and the children, and he would build a house onto his father's house. And that house that he would build would have a common wall with his father's house. And when that house was finished, it was then that he would go back to get his bride so that they could be wed. Let me share the words of John 14, verse 2. In my father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I'm going to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back so that you may be with me. Jesus has used this, this story of courtship, if you will, and marriage to describe how Jesus will be there for those who are his as he ushers them into a heavenly kingdom. In a similar way, the ten virgins. They are the undefiled bride of the church. They are waiting for the return of the bridegroom. They're waiting for the man without sin, who is Jesus, to come. Now, a parable is often described as a, an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. And Jesus tells us that the kingdom of heaven will be compared to ten virgins that took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. 
Ten virgins waiting for a bridegroom. Waiting for the return of Jesus Christ, the time of his return is unknown. Why ten? Why the specific number ten? Well, ten denotes, denotes completeness. Under ancient law, when, when there were as many as ten Jews could get together, they could then start a synagogue. There was a complete assembly of those of the Hebrew faith. Ten virgins represent all of Christendom. Out of that complete assembly of ten, five have enough oil, five do not. This suggests that in the event of the coming of Christ, only half of those who claim to be followers of Jesus will be ready. Jesus is warning his disciples that not everyone who claims to be a, Christ, to, claims to be a Christian will enter the kingdom of heaven. You're in church today. You're exercising your privilege to worship God. It's the righteous thing to do. It's the right thing to do to be here in church, to, to hear his word, to, to pray, to sing the songs of, of praise that we sing, to, to present an offering unto God, to be in fellowship with others. Why then are the odds 50-50 that those who gather throughout Christendom to worship today will enter the kingdom of God? The ones who had enough oil, they were wise because they were ready for his coming. They didn't know when he would come, but they knew that he would come. And the oil was a very special part of their life, not only in that instance, but in the life of a Jew. Oil was not only what they would use to keep their oil lamps burning, but it was the oil that would be used in the, in the temple to keep the menorah or the lamp stand lit. When it came to the anointing of priests, it was the oil that was poured over the priest's head to anoint him as a sign of the Holy Spirit had come upon him. Oil of the anointing and oil of the lamps is a symbol of the presence of the Holy Spirit. You know, in a similar way, we anoint the sick. We do this as a symbol of the presence of God. Because the wise knew what to expect, they had prepared for his, for his coming. They prepared for his coming by having enough oil on hand. Those who are prepared for his coming are the ones that will enter the kingdom of heaven. I was reminded of an advertisement as I was thinking through this, uh, waiting for someone to show up. It wasn't too many years ago there was an advertisement on the radio for, for Motel 6. This is Tom Bodette for Hotel 6. I'll keep the light on for you. You know, I'll keep the light on for you. This advertisement was saying, they didn't know when you were going to show up at Motel 6, but when you got there, they were going to be ready for you. And there was going to be a place for you to stay, and they were going to welcome you. You know, in a similar, in a similar way, we don't know when Jesus will come. We don't know what time. But we do know that we need to be prepared. The foolish virgins were the ones that failed to have enough oil to keep their lamps lit. The foolish ones were the ones that did not have enough oil. Even they, though they knew what was required to keep their lamps burning, give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. You know, in a similar way, many of us know what it will take to experience new birth, or as some say, born again from above. The sad reality, there are many who know what it takes to receive this special gift of salvation. They claim to be Christians, and many go to church, and many have not accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Recently, one of my fellow pastor friends at the Messiah Village, he was approached by a 90-year-old woman. She had read one of those little spiritual tracts, those little booklets you find around, people are giving out and telling you about, you better do this or you're going to go to a dark eternity. 
Well, she had had one of those. It was about salvation. She'd gone to her church all her life, but she had never accepted Jesus Christ into her heart. She wanted to know more. And as she asked that pastor, that pastor knelt down beside her, shared a fundamental understanding of salvation, shared a prayer with her, and when he was finished, she said, Is that it? Is that all there is to it? In inviting Jesus Christ into your Lord, into your life as Lord and Savior, it's simple. But yet many, many neglect to do it. The coming of the Lord, it has no parameter as far as age. You're never too young or too old to open up your hearts to him. Reminded of Nicodemus, the ruling member of the Sanhedrin, senior in years. And yet he asked Jesus, what must I do? And Jesus says, you must be born again. The words of Apostle Paul, for whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And if you confess with your mouth the Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. I would like to suggest to you that your faith journey does not end with regeneration, but your faith journey needs to remain fresh. That once you receive Jesus into your heart, once you've opened up the door to a vibrant relationship with our Lord, a relationship needs to be nurtured. It needs to allow itself to grow in grace and in truth. And that journey of sanctification is a lifelong process that goes on forever. You know, many of us are like those virgins that got drowsy and began to sleep, having allowed our faith to grow tired and weary. There are many who go through the symmetrics of, of appearing in church, appearing to be followers of his, but even though they're doing the things that a devout Christian would do, they failed to travel the journey. They failed to love him with all their heart, all their soul, all their strength, and all their might. True, many have maintained an outward and visible appearance of being a Christian. But like the young ladies, they kept their wicks neatly trimmed. They looked apart, but many are foolish. Many have run out of oil. You know what it takes to walk with Jesus, but do you do it? Or will you be like the foolish ones who knew what they needed and failed to do it, waiting until it was too late? The five who kept their lamps burning, their love for Jesus was seamless. Their love was enduring. It would never faltered. It never went dim. When the great moment is here, when Jesus comes, will you be ready on that last time of judgment? There's no more time at that point. The wick will begin to flicker. This is not time to look for more oil. The pathway to eternal life is coming to a close. The door is about to close. The reality is we will all be confronted when the time comes. In this world as we know it today, it will come to closure. There'll be no escaping. It's found in the fifth chapter of Genesis, beginning in the 21st verse. We find Enoch, the father of Methuselah. He lived 365 years. And Enoch walked faithfully with God, and we're told that he was no more because God took him away. Then there was Enoch's son, lived longer, 969 years, but then he died. Now listen again to that contrast between Enoch and Methuselah. Enoch was faithful, walked with the Lord, 
And God took him away. And then there's Methuselah. Well, he died. At the end of life's journey, is it your desire to be with God? Or to pass into a darker eternity? There's only one way to receive salvation. And that is a journey that each man and woman must make on their own. Enoch, he walked faithfully with God, and his eternal destiny was with God. And for his son, there is no, relation, there is no mention of his relationship with God in this life or the next. The Christian faith, no matter how much we may want to pass that on to our children or our grandchildren, we can't. It has to be learned over and over again by each generation. It's an individual commitment between man and woman and God. I recall some time that I, I spent with a man by the name of Roy Clark. Now, it's not the country singer, but a man who had spent his lifetime in the aviation industry. Roy had the vision of starting a, a commuter airline between Harrisburg and Penn State. I should say State College. That airline, it was a small airline. It started out as Pennsylvania Airline. It was a twin beach. And then it became part of Allegheny Commuter, and then a part of Allegheny Airlines, and then a part of US Air, and then US Airways, and now today it's a part of American Airlines. Roy well, was a man with vision. One of the last times I spoke to him, as he was fighting terminal cancer, he shared with me a thought. Our accomplishment in this life is measured by what we leave our children. At his passing, Roy left his children a multi-million dollar inheritance. Now, I'm not here to judge Roy. We're told that a good man leaves an inheritance. Well, he did that quite well. But because Roy was so focused on worldly value, I can't be sure he entered the kingdom of heaven. I really don't know. I don't know if Roy saw Jesus. I hope he did. But I don't know. But what I do know is this. At the end of life's journey, the kingdom of heaven will be for those who are ready when Jesus comes. We need to understand that an inheritance of greater and enduring value, greater than anything in this life, can be found exemplified in Jesus. If a life that nurtures and enables those who follow us, if a life is filled with readiness, if a life is one that will lead to an eternal presence with God, it is one that is found when we lead a life when we be pleasing to our Lord. In a realm of grace, you can't pass salvation on to anyone else. The relationship with Jesus Christ can only be found for those who seek him. What a sad commentary. It will be for those who are among the foolish when ushered into that eternal destiny and Jesus says, I truly say to you, I don't know you. Wow. Several years ago, Linda and I had the opportunity of leading a, a post-high Sunday school class. And Heather, you were, you were in that group. I don't know if you were there when this, this came up, but two of our members were students at Penn State. And they would commute back and forth on weekends, come home on weekends, and they'd come to our Sunday school sometimes. And they were concerned because there was a billboard up close to State College a large display and said, the world is coming to an end. And the date was on it. Harold Camping was the promoter of this concept. Well, those students were flying somewhere on that weekend, on that date. And they didn't want to, didn't want to be in an airplane if Jesus came on that date when they were flying. We shared with them... The words of Jesus is found in Matthew 24, beginning in the 36th verse. 
But about the day or hour, no one knows, not even angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. As it was in the days of Noah, so will be for the coming of the Son of Man. Two men will be in the field working. One will be taken, one will be left. Two women will be grinding with a handmill. One will be taken and one will be left. Therefore, keep watch. Because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. Well, those students made that flight that day. And as we all know, the world didn't come to an end. You know, and I think back over that. Only a fool would profess to know when Jesus is coming. If Jesus didn't know himself when he's coming, how would any man have that insight? Well, in three weeks, we're going to begin the season of Advent, a time leading up to the celebration of the birth of Jesus. Now, Advent is also a time when we anticipate his second coming, when he will return again. May the parable of the ten virgins prepare you to watch, to wait, to listen. My hope for you is this. When Jesus comes, you'll be ready for him. That you will not have waited until it's too late to have your life vibrantly filled with Christ, bathed in the presence of the Holy Spirit. None of us want to hear him say, I don't know you. I hope he will know you as you have come to know him. And he will say to you, well done, my good and faithful servant. Well done. Come and share your master's happiness. Well done. Christ is coming. Christ is coming indeed. Christ is coming. Christ is coming indeed. Amen. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us depart in his peace. May the Lord bless you and keep you, and watch your going out and coming in. Amen.